So, Corey, I guess to, to start with, what does, uh, what does the word legend mean to you when, you when you think of that word? I certainly don't know if it applies to me sometimes. Oh, yeah, it does. Well, I mean, th you know, to me, I mean, it was something that you aspire to, obviously. You know, it, it's something like that you hope for. You know, I mean, you, you grow up listening to music like, you know, like we did, like I did, watching those legends. And, you know, when you, when you have that itch for music, that makes you want to, it's like, I want to be like that, you know? I want to I wanna play shows like that. I want to have these amazing songs like that. So to me, legend means, you know, achieving dreams that even you didn't think of, you know? And, I mean, honestly, I mean, my career is built on that, you know? I, for me, I would have been happy just, you know, a handful of, kick-ass songs, touring the world, um, full stop, you know? But this, I, this has exceeded every expectation I've, I've ever had. So I guess that's, that's what, you know, being a legend means really to me is, is the fact that you went so far past what your ceiling was that you've now started having to create dreams to, to, to <laughs> achieve, you know? <laughs> So it's, uh, it's very humbling, very, very humbling. When someone says, you know, rock, a rock legend, who, who, are the names that, who are the names and the faces <laughs> that come into your head? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, you're obviously uh, Lemmy, Ozzy, um, Patton. Patton, oh God, yes. I mean, he was, he's the whole reason that I sing the way I sing, you know. Um, Diamond David Lee Roth is a legend, <laughs> you know. That, I mean, just, you know, all those... To me, the, the legends who inspired me were the ones who were very unique, you know? They didn't sound like anybody else, and yet they would go on to inspire people to sound like them, you know? Like you talk about James Hetfield, had at the time, really, no one sounded like him, and now everyone, myself included, sounds like him, and it's very funny, you know? So it's like, those are the dudes who, to me, those were the legends, you know? The ones who they... They took no shit, and but they but they gave it as much as they wanted to, you know. You're returning to the, uh, the Kerrang Awards again, seven-time winner in the past with Slipknot. Yeah, that's weird. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And a, and a, and a four-time a four-time presenter as well. Let's yeah. not forget you. You've well, run. Well, I, I you've think those suits show. have uh, not let anyone forget that. <laughs> Which, uh, which is more fun, presenting or being out in the room? And, uh, oh, presenting by <laughs> yeah. far. Because it's like, you don't give a shit, man. You're just like, whatever. This band sucks. They'll win, you know? <laughs> if you could have been a fly on the podium with me and Ian talking so much shit, he'd just look at me and he'd go, ah, they got a chance in hell, don't they? And I'm like, well, their name is on the fucking award. I think we know who's going to win. <laughs> It, I mean, we had so much fun doing that. It, as much fun as it was presenting, it was just as much fun hanging out with one of my best friends, you know, who is also a rock legend, you know? When you can say that Scott Ian is like your bro, <laughs> whatever, man. It's so fucking weird. So it was us, it literally just us taking the piss out of each other, out of everybody. That, to me, like being out there and like twisting your guts up for those awards is... Oh God, it's such. Oh, fuck that. I can't. I can't because you're just like, do they like me? Yeah. I'd rather be up here going. I don't. They didn't like me at all this year. That's okay. I'm running this fucking joint. You know. <laughs> Between the suits that you mentioned, obviously oh, yes. renowned for your Krang Awards suits. <laughs> um, but you know, Slipknot has obviously made its mark on the awards as well. You've uh. set fire to a table. You've trashed pretty much everything in sight. <laughs> um, are we going to expect something similar tomorrow night? No. <laughs> uh, I brought my family with me this time. <laughs> We're going to just chill. I tell you, that first Kerrang, uh, that first Kerrang Awards that we went to, that we all went to, we were so fucking fucked up, too. Like, we were just like, really, this is great. We had no idea that, you know, anything like that was going to happen. And you talk about setting fire to that table. That was actually Sid trying to show us a trick. <laughs> it went horribly wrong. He was just like, he's like, I could do this cool, like, fire lantern thing with a napkin. And we were like, all right. 
sitting right there, like in the middle, and people just looking at us. It's like, what the fuck are these dicks in masks? What are they doing here? And then, of course, we smoked everyone won like three awards that year. But so Sid lights this this paper lantern. It was really just a, a this handkerchief that he just kind of tied in knots. He's like, ooh, watch this. And, he's, uh, and then, oh, Jesus Christ, that's not going out. <laughs> literally, literally set the damn thing on fire. And then to add insult to injury, when we won for best band in the world, we threw the damn table, <laughs> threw that booze and crap everywhere. And uh, poor Britt Eklund broke her ankle slipping on it. So, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, I still have the Kerrang Award that was sitting on that table. It was the, uh, I, I want to say it was for best single for Wait and Bleed, and uh, w part of the K broke off at the top. So we uh, cellophane taped a piece of cardboard to fill it in, because it just looked like a, a really shittily drawn lowercase h for the <laughs> longest time. So we just kind of filled it in, and we were like, oh, this could work. And I still have that to this day. I made sure I grabbed it off the, off the ground. So That's awesome, man. You're um, welcome. <laughs> you're in the UK, obviously. You're on the road to slip, uh, Stone Sour. Yes. At the moment. Yeah. Thank, how thank is, you. Uh, how has being back on tour been going for you? It's been awesome. Like, like, we just played Nottingham last night, and it was, how fucking crazy was that? Oh, my God. And it was so, it was very moist. Why? <laughs> it was more moist last night at Rock City than it was the other night at Roundhouse. And, I mean, the kind of air that you can taste. <laughs> and you don't want to, you know? You're just like, why am I, oh, god damn it. Uh, it's getting your eyes, you know? Um, these shows were fantastic. I mean, there's just three, I mean, they sold out like that um, after this many years doing it. And to really have the kind of impact that this album had really show with the amount of people coming out to the shows. I mean, it's just been... It's been a blessing, you know, and these, you know, these were the shows that we, we were looking forward to the most, you know, we love playing Europe, we love playing all the, doing the festivals and everything, but these three shows in the UK, like, it really felt like coming home for us, so it was, anybody who came, thank you very much for coming in. How does the Stone Sour touring life compare to the Slipknot touring life? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's a lot less cursing. Uh, there's a lot less smell. <laughs> well, I take that back because Johnny Chow changed his diet and now it is just a submarine of shit. <laughs> it's so bad. Um, I mean, it's, you know, the, both bands live play with a certain amount of intensity and that will lead you to be intense people with intense personalities. Slipknot is no exception. Obviously, you've seen us on stage trying to kill each other. Uh, Stone Sour is much more about how close can I get to him and fart during this song. <laughs> and then he'll notice it during his solo and be like, you know, he's in, you know, chat, you know it's either Tooch or Josh, just, you know, they got the guitar face, and then all of a sudden, it's so funny, and it's happened more than you'll know. And it's just about, you know, the joy. And, and I'm in two great bands with dudes that, for better or for worse, we are family. And, you know, when you are so dedicated to something like this, you know, tensions can run high, tensions can run low. However, you're there for each other, you know? And after a great show, after a fantastic show that you've just come out and you've just fucking murdered and you left everything on the table, there's no better feeling than being in that room with those guys that you just did that with and going, fuck, fuck yes. Like, and it, it doesn't matter whether it's, uh, you know, O2 Arena or Nottingham Rock City. It is these, it's the same feeling of, holy shit, we get to do this. This is so amazing. So, yeah. Is it much of a different mindset to get into before you go on stage with Stone Sour or Slipknot? Because I, I, well, yeah, sort of, I, mean, I know you've spoken in the past about the, you know, when, when you put the, you know, you, you get suited get up, the, you get yeah. the mask on for Slipknot, and that really gets you into that headspace. Oh, yeah, yeah. How does that work for Stone Sour? Stone Sour, man, I mean, it's still, you know, I mean, you're, you know you're going to go out there and just attack the music. But for me, it's more about 
how, you know, like, like, what the fuck am I gonna wear? You know, I, like, how weird, <laughs> how weird can I get with my clothes? Like last night, I wore this fucking. Okay, and first of all, this the the second hottest gig I've played in a long fucking time. I've got on wool pants, <laughs> checkered, black and white check. They looked good. I'm not saying they didn't look good. However, you could have baked bread in my crotch. That's how fucking hot. <laughs> So it's really just about like, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I mean, it's, it's a different type of mentality because it's, it's a little lighter in it. You know, it's, it's a, it's more of a rock and roll mindset than it is that kind of that dark metal mindset of, of Slipknot, you know, and you know, each one really has a, a warm spot inside of me, you know, like I couldn't have one without the other because that's so much my personality. So with Stone Sour, it's just much more about, you know, what, what's going to make me feel cool, you know? And then with Slipknot, it's like, well, which mask is going to let me vomit the least tonight because it smells like death, you know? And I don't ever win. It's always, it doesn't matter what I choose. Every mask makes me fucking throw up. So there you go. Um, we've, we've taken some uh, questions from Corey Taylor and Stone Sour and Slipknot fans around the world. Oh, boy. This All well. right, here we go. Um, this is actually a very sensible one to start. Um, Carl from Nova Scotia, a long way away from yeah. North London, um, he wanted to know about your, your sort of differing warm-up techniques for each band w with your voice. You know, what, what do you go through before a show to, to physically prepare yeah, your yeah. voice? For I mean, it's honestly, I warm up the same way for both bands. Um, what I do, it, it, it depends on if I'm sick or if I'm, if I'm well, you know, and, and largely because of my allergies, Half the time, it's just about trying to figure out, you know, how badly I'm going to have a snot pouring out of my face. Sorry, I know this is probably <laughs> destroying so much cool shit for you. Um, it's more about just, you know, just putting on music and singing along to it and finding out where I'm at. You know, if I, when, the best thing that I can teach singers is don't worry about scales. Don't worry about any of that shit because... People who spend three hours doing scales are going to go out on the stage and their voice is going to sound about this big because you've, you've wiped your ass with that warm tone of your vocals, you know? Now you've managed to wear it down so thin that then when you do pop on some of the higher notes, it's, well, of course you did. You've just been warming up for three fucking hours, for God's sakes. Even I, after three hours, I'm just like, right, I'm done, I've had it, I can't fucking sing anymore, you know? So what you do is you save that warm tonality, you know, by just warming up a little bit, you know, and maybe this works just for me or for other people. But if you just put on some songs that you know you can hit the good notes with, you know, for me, it's like it's uh, Pearl Jam, Misfits and Rat, which is I mean, that's my and every once in a while I'll throw some Metallica in there um, just to kind of get that grit going. And then I do this really weird Kind of, you, you, oh, oh. I do that for about, it's funny, right? You can always find what room I'm in by just listening. It's like, oh, Taylor's next door. And, and this, is, this is true. I do that for about 10 seconds um, until I can feel that kind of loosen up. And then I go on stage. So it's like, I don't spend a lot of time doing it because I want to save the strength. I want to save that, that, like I said, that tonality. Because you can tell the difference between someone who has allowed their voice to warm up naturally. And it saves that kind of strength. It saves that kind of grit. As opposed to someone who has warmed up for three hours doing scales that you're not going to fucking sing on stage. And then you get out there and you sound like Mickey Mouse. And I'm not talking shit on people who do that. Because it, if it works for them, good for them. But for me, it's more about saving that strength because I know that's going to be able to equal the intensity that I just, you know, that I need for these songs. You mentioned um, the last Stone Sour record, Hydrograd, uh, yeah. earlier. Yeah. It's coming up to its first anniversary now, which seems crazy. It feels it's like very it crazy. Out, like, yeah, last totally. Week or <laughs> How do you look back on that album uh, a, a year on? Fondly, very fondly. You know, I mean, it's, you know, there's always. There's always stuff, for me anyway, like you look back and after, you know, four or five months, you always go back and go, I wish I would have done this and that or added this or added that. 
But with, with Hydrograd, man, I mean, we really, I, I think for me, the energy in that album, the, the positive vibe that you can hear, that joy, honestly, in that album, the, uh, the musicianship, uh, the layering, the mix, like everything. I, I still love it. Like I just put it on the other day and I hadn't listened to it in a while. And I was like, fuck, this is such a great fucking album. And, you know, that's what you want when you put albums out, you know. Every artist is going to come back and be like, oh, yeah, I fucking love this, you know, blah, 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 blah. But we all listen. We're all full of shit, by the way, because we all listen to stuff and go, God, you know, I could have put another harmony here. Maybe I could have sang this, strengthened this. Oh, this is, there's a cool fucking guitar line I just thought of. Albums aren't finished. They're abandoned, just like movies. You know, movies are never finished. They're abandoned because at some point you just have to fucking put them out there, you know? So for me, as close as you can get to being absolutely satisfied is what you have to aim for, you know? And with Hydrograd, as far as like an, a rock album goes... That was as close as I could, I could feel like we came to really fucking achieving it, you know. And I'm absolutely fucking chuffed with the the performance, the the energy. Like you can just, it's it's just an alive album. Like you can listen to it, and you can still feel the fact that we're in the room playing with each other. And well, okay, not playing with each other. Like, grow up, yeah, grow up. Crazy. First of all, hey, let's let's be adults here, fuckers. Anyway. Touching each. I mean, hey, okay, that was, you know what, that was my fault. But no, just, you know, knowing that and feeling so happy, connected, stoked about that. It's a rarity in this business, man. And especially people who care about it as much as, as I do, as we do. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely still to this day stoked about it because a lot of people, they listen to it. And they didn't get it at first, and they kind of were like, man, eh, whatever. And then they came back to it, maybe through other people, and were like, oh, I gotta fucking give this another chance. And then they're like, I get it now. You know, sometimes you have to get the fuck rid of your expectations before you can actually enjoy something. You know what I'm saying? Think about that movie that you got dragged to, and you were just like, I, you know, whatever. I wasn't even gonna see this, I don't even care. And then you come out of it going, fuck, that was the best movie I've seen in six months. That's what it's about. If you can let go of your expectations sometimes, you can listen to something and truly enjoy it. It's when we've made our minds up that we've let ourselves down. And I think that's, that's, that's something that's not fair to the music itself. There's some music that's garbage. <laughs> Let's just fucking put that right. However, there's also music that is fucking brilliant and we will talk ourselves out of enjoying it nine times out of ten because of preconceived notions. We had uh, a reader, Christy, um, write in and said that her daughter, um, Gabriel, has, uh, she has one bugbear with the album, and that's that song three is track five <laughs> on the album. <laughs> As a fuck with you, does it? Yes, which, it does. Which, which, let's be honest, is, is indefensible. But do you care <laughs> to give it a try anyway? Well, yeah. <laughs> you want to realize well, okay, the song, it's, it's called song number three. It was, it was called song number three before we even put it together. A, there's a reason that it's called song number three, and I've talked about it in a couple different places. Um, it's called song number three because it's actually the combination of two different songs that I had written. And I was never happy with either one. Like, there were really great bits of one and really great bits in another. And I was like, how the fuck do I make this? these really good how does this work and then i started kind of like putting it together like with a like a puzzle piece and i went oh this is oh you kind of have that yeah that eureka moment and that's why it became song number three it took two songs to make this third song and there you have it there's your title song number three and the reason it's a song it's like track five is because that's what felt good in the track order and I don't give a shit if it hurts people's OCD. <laughs> I love it. I love the fact that it's just, it bothers people enough that they wrote a fucking question about it. You should have put it at four. That would have really... You know, and, so I, and I, you know what? And I thought it was like, you know what? That's a little greedy. Maybe, like, I thought putting it in number five would be enough that people would be like, all right, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it is just that name, you know? But no, people are like, it's really fucking bothering me. And nothing I say will make them feel better. And I'm like, ah, that's your hell. Go ahead. 
Um, talking of albums, to change it up, uh, Skylar from California um, has written in, which I'm sure is a question that everyone here has as well. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of talk and whispers about a new Slipknot record. Oh, I knew this was coming. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're being filmed and streamed out of the world. Yeah, there's, there's no, no getting dodging. away with it. Yeah, yeah. Just, you talk about putting somebody on the spot. What can you say? I have fantastic news. Um, we are, I mean, you know, some of you know, but I'll, I'll just make it official. We are working on a new album right now. Um, it's, it's only in the demo stages right now. Um, however, we, ha we have very, very uh, serious... And I will say tentative because, you know, the best way to make God laugh is to announce your plans out loud. However, we have very serious tentative plans to go into the studio at the beginning of next year and uh, get, this, get this fucker going. We have um, 16 songs written right now, and they are fucking dangerous. <laughs> I mean, I loved Point Five. This album, to me makes point five look like nobody's business like this is this is iowa level of heavy Hell yeah. and uh Woo! fuck you say i have to go out and tour this shit man <laughs> <laughs> at my age fuck you i can't i can feel those songs on my back you know you can do it <laughs> um I am really, really excited about it. Um, I've been talking to, I, I talk to the guys in Slipknot all the time. I talk to Clown like either every day or every other day. I've been talking to Jim, V-Man, Jay, Mick, Craig, uh, Chris, Sid. Um, we're all really, really, really excited about this stuff. So, uh, and it's coming together really fucking well. So be prepared for 2019, which weirdly is the 20th anniversary of our first album. Shit's about to get fucking real again, so take that as you will. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cat loves it. Just to step outside of music for just a little while, because obviously you have, there's a lot more to Corey Taylor than, than just your music. <laughs> You're a writer, author, actor, voice star on Doctor Who. What, Fuck yeah, yeah, I was. <laughs> what do all those different outlets and endeavors give you that that maybe music doesn't man i you know i'm just greedy to be honest i mean when it gets down to it i'm just a greedy prick <laughs> i love stuff like i love trying to do things that i'm interested in you know like i i mean i love doctor who I, I always have i've been watching it since i was a kid so getting the opportunity to be a part of that you know to be a part of that history and be a part of that canon like i was like fuck I wish you could have seen me. I got to go in the TARDIS. I got to go in and I touched everything. Like I fucking, I was just like, this phone, this is, I can use this phone. I can touch these buttons. Oh, I'm going over here, this fucking thing. I don't know what the fuck that does, but I can touch it and I just, ooh, that comes out. Ooh, that comes out. The only thing they told me I couldn't touch was the blackboard. They're like, these are all equations that are, you know, that we're, we're shooting in order so you can't and I was like but now I want to do nothing <laughs> but touch it can I just put my fingerprint no okay what if I just look really hard at it a, I, and I just I must have looked like a fucking like a tw like a 10 year old just fucking <laughs> running around putting my DNA on everything but getting to do that and then you know, after then, you know, not being able to tell anyone, oh, that was fucking torture. Because then it didn't come out. Yeah, I couldn't even tell you. Remember, we were talking about it. And I was just like, oh, God, huge news. And I can't fucking say anything. And then, you know, like eight months later, finally being a, oh, yes, I mean, yes, it's Doctor Who. So getting to do stuff like that, man, that for me is just extra, you know, like that's. I love doing, and I only do stuff that I want, that I'm interested in, you know? Like being in the movies. It's like, I've, you know, I've always been interested in acting. I'm fucking not a great actor. However, I'll do that shit all day, you know? I'll be the guy coming in, it's me, and I'll fuck <laughs> off. You know, I'd love to, I want to be in a fucking horror movie so bad. Another one, excuse me. I was, I was, in, I was already in one, but I'd love to get killed. You're like, I want to get fucking done up with the, I don't care how uncomfortable it is, fucking just with the... <laughs> 
I want to fuck. I want to take something to the throat. It, hey, easy, easy, easy. God damn it. You know, we'll file you all out and let the adults back in. <laughs> oh, anyway. Um, yeah, man. I just, I love, I love doing that stuff. And I love the fact that at this point now in my career, I'm getting to do more of that stuff. You know, being able to write the comic was awesome. Um, you know, writing the books, Jesus Christ. I was so stoked to write the first one. I didn't think I'd get to write four. And now they're, they're, they're fucking beating my bag up for the fifth. For those, like, what's the fifth one going to be? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, pictures. <laughs> I pitched that and they said no. <laughs> fucking assholes. I tell, I tell, you know what? I'll tell them that all of you really adamantly want a Cord Taylor fucking coloring book. I'd love to see. As I just lean in hard. Two words. Coloring book. And see what fucking happens. They'll just be like, get out. Uh, Dylan from Georgia. With probably the most sensible, practical question of oh, the night. Oh, well, I don't want to hear this. Just, just wants to know how you literally fit everything in. Because you obviously you have so many endeavors. Family life, personal life. How do you go about even beginning to process the amount that you do shit i don't know um a lot of people would say i don't uh i mean it's it's about priorities you know it's about it's about priorities and it's about focus um for me you know i mean it, it's it kind of comes down to the same rationale i have with both bands you know it's like when i'm doing one that's my main focus it doesn't mean i don't do demos and stuff with the other but that's my main focus. And then when, when it's time for this one, this one goes on hold and we dabble, dabble, dabble. But my main focus is this. This is what I'm working. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm really focused on. So with that, with all the other stuff, I mean, it really is about focus again. But then also don't force it. You know, if, if you have, if you have the, the, you know, the, the, the spark right then. But if you don't, don't force yourself to write. That, at least that's what works for me. I know a lot of people who they try to fight through writer's block or anything like that. And, uh, oh, look at that. We're on, I don't know what those, it's a, it's, we're live streaming right now, I guess. And it's like, how you doing, dude? Your forehead looks amazing. <laughs> um, so, for, I mean, for me, it's about striking when the creative juices are flowing, you know. So I'll write two or three chapters at a time um, and one sitting or two sittings if I feel like I know where I'm at, you know. Um, but I don't sit down and just try to force it just to get, you know, I, I call those useless sentences because then you're just, it's just kind of taking up space and it doesn't really say anything. Um, it's the same thing with writing songs. You know, if I'm not feeling it, I just get away from it. And when I get that inspiration, I sit down and I write it. Um, you just use the time when you got it, you know, and when you, when you're not feeling it, be a dad, be a fucking, you know, be a boyfriend, husband, be whatever it is else you do, because you never know when you're going to have that time. And trust me, it's tough. Being away from my kids is really tough. I got one with me today, but I got two other ones that I haven't seen in a while. So it's like I'm constantly, I'm always going to be a dad, but I'm not always going to be there. So take advantage of that time when you can, you know. Strike when the iron's hot, when you get the creativity going. But when you're not, go back to what you are, which is a dad forever, you know. In terms of your writing, um, Callum from Glasgow um, wanted to talk about... Um, your your author work and your your writing and he wants to know what your favorite book and your favorite author is uh just in general oh good lord um my favorite book of all time fiction is uh the stand by stephen king um i've been on i've been on record as saying that and it's the uh the unabridged version with the hundred extra a hundred thousand extra words, which I bought the day it came out in '88, and I still have my hard copy, which I've carried from house to house to to fucking garbage bag full of my belongings. That I I kept that book because that yeah, oh, it's fucking huge, dude. It's that big. 
It is that big. You can't grip it like a like a soda can. You have to use two hands because it's a fucking weapon at at some. It's ridiculous. Um, but I've read it to the point where even the hardcover is dog-eared. Like it's like it's got the bends. Like it's it's been lived in. It's been loved. It's it's yeah. It's my favorite book of all time. Nonfiction. I would have to go with Please Kill Me, which is uh, uh, an oral history of punk rock that came out, I want to say it was 97, 98, something like that. Legs McNeil and another person put it together, Neil Strauss, I think. And it's really, it, it's more about the New York punk scene, but it dabbles with England, it dabbles with the West Coast, it definitely gets into Ohio and Detroit because it talks about the Dead Boys. But it's, if you're into punk rock, if you're into music history, period, it is fucking amazing. And it will lead you down a whole rabbit hole of other books that have that oral history kind of vibe to it. And uh, it's, it's fantastic. So those are my two favorite books. Um, Jess here uh, would like to know, on a completely different tilt, um, what the song that you've written that means the most to you personally is. Oh, shit. Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I have several, you know, with both bands, actually. Um, I mean, Snuff probably is one of the ones that means the most to me now just because of the, the correlation between it and Paul. Um, really, if Paul hadn't championed that song, I don't think we would have recorded it. But he loved it and saw the potential with it and really wanted us to do it, you know. So now when I play it during, you know, my solo shows, like that's who that's, who that's for. Like, and that's, I, I try to do it as well as I can. With Stone Sour, man, you know, I have to go with Through Glass just for the fact that I didn't f know what that song was going to be, you know. Like... I literally wrote that song with food poisoning, sitting in a bed, shitting myself. <laughs> this is a true story. In Gothenburg, Sweden, I was on the, the Volume 3 tour with Slipknot. We got to Gothenburg, Sweden on a day off. We were all stoked, you know, because that tour was long. And uh, we got it, you know, the first thing me and Fane did, because Fane got it too, is we went across the street to the McDonald's. We, we just shoved a couple of cheeseburgers in our face, and we're like, all right, I'll see you in like 10 minutes. And then hell broke loose. And I mean, holding on to the bowl naked, <laughs> hell broke loose. And that lasted, thank God we had this time off, for two and a half days. And it was the fucking worst shit I've ever felt. Not only was it going out this exit, it was flying, I mean, fleeing from this one. And at one point, I didn't have the strength to put the Do Not Disturb sign on. And here comes house cleaning. And they just looked, they, like you would have thought like they had caught me cutting up a body. Like it was that, that level of holy shit. And I, and of course, I'm weak, I'm dehydrated. There's nothing left in me and I just, But, and here's the, the, the little, the postscript on this. Um, I was, uh, I, I couldn't move. And the only channel that was really in English was MTV Europe, which at the time was even worse than it is today, really, in my opinion. Um, and every song just got worse and worse and worse to the point where I wanted to, like, it wasn't enough that I wanted to die because of the food poisoning. Now I just wanted to die just to make this noise go away. And I just started thinking this song in my head. And I rolled over. Once I got a little strength, I rolled over and I wrote the chorus out briefly and then I just started writing the lyrics and I didn't even work on the music until I got home about three months later and that song is a very angry song you know a lot of people are like oh I dedicate this to my baby or you know this song is about you know somebody in prison no no there's no this song is about fuck MTV and fuck all this bull like it's such an angry song and the fact that it is turned into like this whole thing where it's out of my hands now what it's about and the fact that it's like even more people sing it now than they did you know 10 years ago when it came out or fuck 12 years ago actually 
it's astounding, you know? So I think that's the one that I'm the most proud of with Stone Sour because I had no fucking intentions of writing a number one song like that. I was just throwing up out of my ass. Which leads us into a, a, a serious question. Yeah, that's a good segue. Now, and on that bombshell. <laughs> um, Andy from Hull um, wrote in, he wants to know how it feels for you to, to hear stories from people who are moved and affected by your songs and to have those songs mean so much to them. How, how is it for you when you get a chance to talk to them and, and to hear those stories? How does that make you feel? I mean, it's, it's, it, used to, it used to trip me out. You know, like it, it honestly used to make me not self-conscious, but really um, overwhelmed with emotions that I couldn't, I, I didn't know how to process because I've always had a hard time with pride. I've always had a hard time. I know coming from me, um, I've always had a hard time with that sort of self-righteousness I guess is what I th what I thought it was you know so anytime I would get um, complimented or someone would share something like that with me I would get uh, very self-conscious and really not know how to take it but as time's gone on and I've, I've talked to other artists about it it's it's I've realized that it's something very much to be proud of there's a difference between pride and ego and for me I was I was uh, I was associating one with the other and that's not the way it usually is. For me, it was more about accepting a compliment, which I've never been fucking good at. And, and accepting a compliment that really impacts someone. It's not like just saying, oh, it's a lovely rose garden you have, which is a very nice compliment. But this was more of like what you went through and how you shared it with us saved my life. And that is something that you can't really quantify and, and process in the moment. So I've had to learn how to accept compliments like that and accept the fact that what I've done is, has changed people's lives and helped them get on. And, I, and I, I talk to hundreds of kids, whether it's online or in person, and you know the, what they share with me is incredible. So to me, that is the best responsibility that I could ever have, you know, beside, outside of being a dad and whatnot, that responsibility of helping someone get through the bad times and they're fucking brutal sometimes. I'll take that over Grammys, awards, any shit, any fucking day of the week. So it's, it's something I'm very proud of now. Um, and it's something that I try and encourage people to talk about because if you can talk about it in relation to a song, then you can talk to other people about it and slowly but surely start to put it behind you. It's about the relation that you have with it. And I think in this day and age, if we do that, we can maybe correlate that with some sort of empathy and be able to let go of that shit and lead better lives. Not to get all hippie and shit. I apologize. But you know what I'm saying, you know? As a music fan yourself, have you ever had the opportunity to, to pass those sentiments on to artists that, that I, uh, you admire? I, I kind of did, um, but I feel like I failed it miserably. Um, when I met Henry Rollins... I couldn't really even look at him because it was now, and let me give you a little backstory. Like he, um, he did this album called rise above, which was ra raising money for the West Memphis three at the time. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's fucking amazing. And he, um, did the album with this band called mother superior, which was his band at the time. And they were re-recording black flag songs and they, he did a bunch, uh, but he also had a bunch of people come in and get, do guest shots, you know. And uh, it, was, uh, it was insane. Like, he called me on the phone and asked me. Now, this was 2001, 2002, so I was barely an itch in my career's pants at the time, you know. Um, 
and I was like, why is Henry Rollins calling me? What the fuck? Really? And he was the coolest dude, you know? Like, and I mean, I'm a massive Rollins fan from his work with Black Flag to the Rollins band to his spoken word to his books to, you know, 213, all across the thing. I'm a huge Rollins fan. And he was so respectful on the phone got right to the point didn't fuck around and i just sat there going yeah 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 like a fucking asshole you know and i basically you know, he asked me to do the song that i did on on the album and uh so then i flew to la to hang out with him and my, i had uh, my best friend at the time we were both massive black flag flag fans and i was like come on we gotta go we gotta do this so i took him with me and now imagine this we we had landed within an hour and a half we are now sitting at a steakhouse with henry rollins sitting across from us and we are just fucking <laughs> like this oh uh, no no oh no no <laughs> and it's so, and, it, and he just he's chewing a piece and he just puts the fork down and he leans back and he goes okay Let's just get this over with, all right? And we're like, we're like, what? This is like, come on, just. There's no way that we're gonna be able to hang out all day like this. You just fan out, do whatever you have to do. And I just went, I love you. <laughs> and it was all. It was all at the time, like, cause my, you know, my buddy, he was at least you know, eloquent, like, he, at the time, like, I was so fucking intimidated, too, this is fucking Henry fucking Rollins, and, uh, so he just starts going immediately into, you know, stuff about SST, and, like, all this stuff, and, and I'm just sitting there going, <laughs> I finally got my mouth together, and I started asking him about, you know, um, we were both kind of, we had both kind of gone through some vocal issues at that time, and, you know, I started kind of hitting up, and I just let him know. I was like, look, I was like, you're writing. Your, you know, your whole career is something that I would kill to emulate, you know? And he said, it's not the career, it's the work. And, he, you know, that really resonated with me, you know? And that kind of, like, really reinforced the fact that my work ethic, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of bands will go half-assed, and they'll do a great job with it. But for me, it's, it's, it's about never, get, like, never letting up on it. And he was the perfect example of that. He busted his ass and worked his ass off, not only for music, but for quality. And he put, very, he put a lot of emphasis on quality. He's like, you're going to do something, do it with your heart, and do it with everything you've got. You know? And to be able to thank him for that. Um, and even he was just like, ah, pfft, whatever, you know, it was still enough for me to feel like I was paying that forward, you know, and uh, yeah, that felt good. Felt good to be able to say that. I think we've got time for a couple more questions, so I'll, I'll throw it over to the to the audience questions that we had uh, come in. Um, so Damien from Huddersfield uh, wants to know that if you could swap position with any other member from Slipknot for one show. Who would you want to see fronting the band, and what would you want to do? <laughs> oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> Clown. Yeah. Oh, because he and I, like, behind the scenes, I'm so much weirder than he is sometimes. And he'll let me, he's like, Taylor, oh, you're freaking me out, you know? And I live to fuck with him. Like it's, if what, any, anytime I can get him to do that, if I'm standing right here and he's talking to someone and then all of a sudden he becomes aware that I'm right, he just, <laughs> and then it becomes, well, you know, I was going to, oh, I live for it. And then I'll get right up on him and I'll just use my nose breath <laughs> and just, just give him a little bit. And he just, oh, Taylor, you know, so I would love to switch places with him for one show and because I, I love playing percussion and I would also love to watch him get through all the fucking singing and words and shit that I got to fucking spew while also keeping an eye out for those crazy fuckers because they, they come after me. All the time they come after me. They've set me, they used to set me on fire. 
And so, so now I have to have fucking eyes here while also remembering all the harmonies, while also being able to sing, while also being able to fucking work the crowd. Now I'm also waiting for poop and <laughs> pipes and shit, man. It's so I would love to see him because then I would just, I'd just circle him. Just be like, nah, I don't know. Who are you now, clown? Huh? Hmm? So yeah, I'd switch places with him in a heartbeat and then watch him try to get through some shit like liberate. And they'd be like, come on, jump, fucker. Let's see what you got. Um, and a final one for the evening. Um, this actually came from an anonymous person on email. So oh, go- oh, this should be good. It could be clown. Uh, <laughs> from, a, from a performance point of view, which of your Slipknot masks is the easiest to cope with on stage and which was the hardest? Oh, God. Uh, no, they were all fucking horrible. Um, I mean, I'll tell you right now, the hardest was my original uh, with the dreads. Uh, anything that's full-headed is like, there's just no getting out of it, you know? At least when you've got like, you know, just kind of a half mask with some buckles and shit, you, you feel, you don't feel like you're singing in a, in a port loo you know? Like, <laughs> but when it's all like, you just put the, the, this big rubber hood on, and it's like there's just there's just no getting out of it. You might as well have just stuck your head in a kaibo. Like it's no no fucking bueno. And uh, so that's definitely those two, that one and the Iowa one because they were basically variations on the same. Those were the worst. Um, especially oh my god the Iowa one. The Iowa one was foam rubber. The, the one yeah. Ugh. So the ones the ones from the first album were thin. They were just fucking rubber, you know. But then, you know, we got a little money, and we were like, well, let's fucking make some cool shit for the Iowa run, and they used foam rubber, which was just basically just like giant sponges. And it just, you could tell where we were at in the show by how big my head was getting, and then how heavy this fucking thing was. was like, ah, oh, God. And then, this is a true story, we were in Kansas City, and it was so wet and so heavy, that fucking thing flew off my head like a fucking wine cork and it was right in the middle of heretic anthem and here i am and i've got black makeup on my face and stuff and i just can't and here it is just sitting in front of me and there's like twenty thousand people and i just kind of went <laughs> and i'm serious this is no joke it was like putting on a rug that had been sitting out in the rain. Yeah, yeah. So this is for you, okay? This is this is for all of you. This is what we go through for each and fucking every one of you. And and we and I love you for appreciating it. So as far as like an easy one, um the uh honestly the volume three one was pretty easy. However, it was the hardest to sing out of because and they call it the they call it the football mask because it got it's got stitches and shit that kind of come up here and it's like looks like a baseball. And I'm like, shut your fucking mouth. <laughs> but because it wasn't uh like um s- like symmetric, I it was hard for me to get the the mic up to my mouth. So it really changed the way that my vocals sounded, which is why now when I do my mask, I make sure that the rubber is, is flush with my mouth so I can get the mic up to it. You know, mask problems. <laughs> there. Mask world problems. There you go. That would be my new fucking web series. It'll be your next book. I know, well, well, no. My next book, I've already got the it. coloring book, out. obviously. Yeah, that'll be the coloring well, book. Mask world problems with Corey Taylor. It'd be great. And then you could cut them out and wear them. <laughs> Fuck, now I got to do it. God damn it. Shite. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, round of applause, please, for Mr. Poirote. Thank you, guys. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks to everyone that's joined us on Facebook. Uh, the Kerrang! Awards is happening tomorrow night at Islington Town Hall. Mr. Corey Taylor will be picking up the Kerrang! Legend Award in association with Marshall. Thank you. Thanks, sir.